So in this session, we'll continue with the development of palate and its anomalies with the craniofacial syndromes. So our specific learning objectives are, you should be able to describe the palatogenesis. You should be able to describe the embryological basis of cleft lip and palate. And you should be able to describe various arch syndromes. So the process of development of palate is known as palatogenesis and it develops in two stages, the development of a primary palate and a secondary palate. Now the critical period of the palate development is from the end of sixth week till the beginning of the ninth week. So any exposure of any kind of drugs or teratogens may hamper the process of palatogenesis. Now, firstly, the formation of a primary palate. So over here, we are seeing the section taken at the nasal pits. So here, these are the nasal pits bounded by the lateral and the medial nasal process. So in the sixth week, the two medial nasal swellings or prominences, they will start approaching towards each other because of the proliferation of the maxillary prominence. They are also start approaching towards each other. So they will compress these medial nasal prominence and they will result in the fusion of these two medial, uh, medial nasal prominences into a intermaxillary segment. Now, secondly, there will be a posterior extension of this intermaxillary segment. So it will form a small part of adult heart palate and it is known as a primary palate. And this intermaxillary segment will also contribute to the pilgrim of the upper lip. So to summarize, the intermaxillary segment is made up of three components, a labial component contributing to the pilgrim of the lip. Sorry. Pilgrim of the lip. Then is the upper jaw or the premaxilla, which is carrying the four, upper four incisor teeth and a palatal component lying anterior to the incisive fossa. So a labial component, a jaw component or the premaxilla and a palatal component of the intermaxillary segment. Now the formation of the secondary palate. So firstly, there is formation of the palatine shells. That is, there is shelf-like outgrowth from the maxillary inner wall of the maxillary prominences. Initially, they are directed obliquely. So here, this is a view from the below. And we have removed the tongue, developing tongue and the mandibular prominence. So these two are the palatine shells. In the midline is the nasal septum and this one is the yellow one is the primary palate. And this one is the frontal section or the from seeing from uh, in front. So this one is the nasal cavity. This one is the approaching nasal septum contributed by the frontonasal prominence. These are the two palatine shelves. Now is the elevation of the uh, palatine shelves. So initially they are oblique and because of the development of the tongue and descent of the tongue, later on they become horizontal and they will start approaching towards each other to fuse in midline. So the fusion is mostly from anterior to posterior side and it is in a Y-shaped manner that is, it is between the primary palate and the two palatine shelves and the junction of the primary palate with the secondary palate is marked by the presence of an incisive foramen. And at the same time when the palatine shelves are approaching each other, the nasal septum is also approaching downwards in the cephalic end of these secondary palate. So the nasal septum is fusing only with the hard palate, not with the soft palate. Now how the hard, how the secondary palate differentiates into a hard and a soft palate. So this, the, this is the line of fusion between the two palatine shelves, which is known as a palatine raffi. So this is invaded anterior three-fourths of this secondary palate is invaded by osteoblast cells. So bone will gradually de uh, develop into the primary palate, into the premaxillary component of the maxilla and in the palatine process of the maxilla and in the palatine bones. While the posterior one-third 
it is invaded by the myogenic cells. So it will convert into the soft palate and a conical projection, which is known as uvula. Now the median palate and raphe, it indicates the line of diffusion between the two palatal crosses, which I've already told you. Now the anomalies related to it. So the facial clefts, the cleft lip and the palate are the common defects which result in abnormal facial appearance and the defective speech. Now, defective speech is because of the incomplete uh, division of the oral and the nasal cavity. So there is a nasal twang in the speech. Then the incisive foramen is considered the dividing landmark between the anterior and the posterior cleft deformities. So those anterior to the incisive foramen include lateral cleft lip, cleft upper jaw and the cleft between primary and secondary palates and those that lie posterior to the incisive foramen include cleft palate and the cleft uvula. Now what are the causes of the cleft palate? So it results from the lack of fusion of the palatine shelves due to four reasons. Either these shelves are very small or they fail to elevate or the fusion process is inhibited. So it will also be combined, it will also result in the uh, anterior as, as well as posterior cleft anomalies and failure of trunk, tongue to drop between the shelves because of the micrognathia. Now the incidence. So cleft lip occurs more frequently in males that it is, uh, and the frequency is around one in 1000 birth. And it, the, the incidence increases slightly with the maternal age. And also if any relative or any family member is suffering from the cleft lip, then the incidence in the uh, uh, occurrence of the cleft lip in the uh, baby will also increase. So over here you can see the, the first one is the normal uh, palate. Uh, the blue one is derived from the median nasal process and these are, the red one are the palatine shelves. So now here the, when the median nasal process, it fails to fuse with the maxillary prominence just anterior to this primary palate. And this is a unilateral cleft lip. When if it is affecting the primary palate also, so then it is a unilateral cleft lip and palate. Then the median nasal prominence, if it fails to fuse with the two maxillary prominence, then it is known as the bilateral cleft lip and palate. Then if the two palatine shelves, they will fail to fuse with each other in the midline, but the Y suture is formed. Then it is known as the cleft palate. And this one is the complete cleft lip and palate when whole of the uh, lateral nasal prominence fail to fuse with the maxillary prominence of one side and the palatine sh shelf of one side fails to fuse with that of the other. So we'll discuss one by one. Firstly is the cleft lip, which commonly occurs in the upper lip. So incidence of the cleft lip is one in 1000 birth and it is more commonly in males. So it is of three types. So one is unilateral. It occurs due to failure of fusion of the maxillary process with the median nasal process of the same side. Then secondly, it is, so this one is the unilateral one. Then is the bilateral when the maxillary process fails to fuse with the median nasal prominences or the frontal nasal process. So this is the bilateral cleft lip. Then central cleft lip or hair lip because of the failure of fusion of the two median nasal prominences. So there is failure of development of fildrum in this type. And the fourth one is the most rarest of all that is cleft lower lip when the two mandibular prominences fail to fuse with each other. Then there are oblique facial clefts which occurs when the maxillary process fails to fuse with the lateral nasal process. So it was fusing along the nasooptic furrow so in this cases the nasolacrimal duct is exposed to the exterior and this is usually bilateral. Now the complete cleft palate so it may be unilateral or bilateral. So cleft palate unlike cleft lip is more common in males and it is uh, respective of the, uh, sorry, more common in females and it is dependent on the environmental insult and it is uh, irrespective of the maternal age. 
So in the unilateral cleft palate, uh, it occurs when the maxillary process on one side does not fuse with the pre-maxilla of that side. So it results in a unilateral complete cleft palate. And it is always associated with the cleft lip because the pre-maxillary component is forming the fibrum. Then the bilateral complete cleft palate in which the pre-maxillary component fails to fuse with these palatine shells of both the sides. So in this, the secondary palate is divided into two equal halves by a median cleft with an anterior V-shape. So to full Y is seen over here, separating pre-maxilla anteriorly and the two palatine shells posteriorly. So cleft palates are more dangerous than the cleft lip because they hamper in feeding and as well as in the speech of the baby. Now the incidence of cleft palate, I, I have already told you, it is more frequent in females and it is not related to the maternal age, nor it, is, uh, nor it has any genetic predisposition. In females, why it is more frequent in females? Because palatal shells, they fuse approximately one week later uh, in females than in males. So this difference explains why isolated cleft palate occurs more frequently in females than, than in males. Then, since it is uh, dependent on the environmental uh, insult, so anti-convulsant drugs, if it is given during pregnancy, so it may, it increases the risk of cleft palate. Then the, the, these are certain anomalies which are uh, inclusive only of the soft palate. So first one is the bifid uvula. Second one is that this bifid uvula is extending somewhat anteriorly. And this one is associated with, with the cleft, uh, palate, uh, cleft palate of the hard palate also along with the soft palate. So generally the cleft uh, palate of the uh, soft palate uh, uh, can be remain untreated but it is uh, essential to treat the cleft palate of the hard part of the palate. Now the first arch syndromes. So uh, you get uh, short notes on the first arch syndrome. So there are two important syndromes of the first arch. That is the treacher collins syndrome and the Peary robin sequence. In the treacher collins syndrome, it is characterized by malar hypoplasia. So because of the first arch, so since the maxillary and the mandibular, mandibular prominences, they are derived from the first arch, so there is hypoplasia of the first arch. So that there is malar hypoplasia, as well as there is underdevelopment of the zygomatic bones, and there is man, mandibular hypoplasia. And since these two prominences are not properly formed, there is down slant slanting uh, palpebral fissures that is the eyes they are directed downwards and they are slanting and the lower eyelid colobomas are there and there is malformed ears as the auricular hillocks they were appearing around the first pharyngeal groove and second one is the peri robin sequence which is tried of micrognathia cleft palate and glossoptosis that is posteriorly placed down then is the third and the fourth pouch syndromes, that is the D. George syndrome, which is because of the micro deletion of the short arm on the 22nd chromosome. It is also known as video below cardiofacial syndrome. And in this, because there is failure of the formation of third and the fourth pouch, so there is defective formation of thymus, absence of thymus, and absence of parathyroid glands. So there is defective migration of the neural crest cells. So there is, that is why there is defect in cardiac outflow tracts also. That's all.